Holy Hindu hexagram. The Star of David cover-up. The so-called enlightened West slaps Hindu symbols onto bad ideas. One example that comes to mind is the militant fascist nationalist socialism. It's so trendy today. This is something we're really, really good at. That is, taking Hindu symbols and slapping them onto fascist flags. And I hope we learn to stop doing this. That's what I hope we will get good at. Indians are probably the most plagiarized folks on the planet, and they had the f Eastern Hemisphere's first holy books. We're quick to forget. Word to the wise, if tomorrow you see an incredibly charismatic politician sport a flag with a shape, I would hit the books and learn all about its rich history, and then just not follow politicians. It never ends well. Get the picture? Moving on. On Saturn. Astronomy, Saturn's Arctic hexagon. This seldom discussed phenomenon was discovered as late as AD 1982 by a space probe named Cassini, after a famous geocentrist contemporary rival of Newton. Yet astonishingly, the hexagram actually came to Eastern Europe as a Saturnian talisman, or amulet, in medieval times, as we shall see. In biology and physics. Hexagrams and hexagons also surround us here on planet Earth, and they surrounded all of our ancient, medieval, and modern ancestors. In India, thousands BC, part one. Hinduism, interlacing hexagram, the original hexagram, incontrovertibly, is of southern India. In Hindu high mythology, Shiva is the auspicious one, Shakti is power or empowerment, and together they beget Murugan, the war commander. And that's your hexagram. Contrary to some folk etymology, the Pennsylvania German word hex does not come from hexagram, but rather from the German word for hag. In India, thousands BC, part two. Yoga, hexagram with outer circle and twelve lotus petals, the heart chakra, anahata, the fourth primary chakra, according to all the main yoga traditions. In Sanskrit, anahata means unhurt, unstruck, and unbeaten. Anahata nad refers to the Vedic concept of unstruck sound, the sound of the celestial realm, which the ancients call ether. Anahata is associated with a calm, serene sound devoid of violence. Planets like Saturn make a sound that has been recorded in confirmation of ancient belief. And that was also by the uh, Cassini probe. In fact, ether theory has a lot going for it, and general relativity, on the other hand, has a lot to prove, contrary to conventional teaching. My wish is that may this whole compassion and serenity business start catching on among those who wave a flag bearing this hexagram. Also, by the way, Vishnu, or preserver or savior, to our left here, literally penetrator, resembles the hexagram and seems to be the origin of the hexagram's ring of Solomon Association, a medieval Muslim feature which is actually going to predate its modern Shield of David identification, as we'll see. What be the Silk Road, my lord? The seldom discussed Silk Road was blazed in the 2000s BC, and Alexander the Great, in his eastward expansion, made it so that Indian silks, spices, ideas, and symbols that had trickled in began just pouring into the Greek, not to mention Hebrew world, especially from 329 BC, when he founded the first city, 
founded the city of Alexandria Escate, or Alexandria the Furthest. Let's remember also, Buddhist monks, missionaries, came as far as Greece, perhaps not to Rome. As well, Rome never ruled India, so the next empire to rule India would be the Muslim Empire. This is why they are so big on these things and brought it to Europe. Speaking of Rome, it's ancient Rome. Saturn is the seldom discussed Roman god of the capital, reproduction and farming, Satus being Latin for sown, and became equated with the Greek Titan, as opposed to Olympian, Kronos, god of time, and father of Zeus, with whom the Latin Jupiter was equated. At the time, Saturn was the most distant sphere people could see. From Saturn we get Saturday, and Saturnalia is Western Europe's predecessor of Christmas time, culturally speaking. And there are some other parallels. Okay. In Kabbalah, that's esoteric Judaism, for those not acquainted in late antiquity. The Kabbalah uses the hexagram, arranging the ten sephirot, or spheres, in it, and placing it on amulets, as you can see to the upper left, and that's Ju according to the Jewish Encyclopedia 1906 edition. Note that the letter Tau is in the center of the amulet. Kabbalah is referred to as Western Tao, where Gnosis is Western Zen. From Pan-Abrahamic Esoteria, this six-pointed mystery fad found its way into Rabbinical Judaism, which likely had a lot to do with the Khazar patronage and monopolization of whatever there remained of Judaism north of Islamica from the 8th century onward. Kabbalistic magic is the source of the vast majority of Western European witchcraft, to include masonry, with Antiochian magic at a distant second. And most of this sorcery is developed in Alexandria, Egypt, which due to its vast library served as the brain of A.D. Judaism and Christianity alike. Later Prague, in today's Czech Republic, would become the capital of this so-called inner Judaism. And there's Madonna. In Galilee, A.D. 3rd or 4th century. The synagogue at the abandoned ruins Tel Hum, it's actually Capernaum, the fishing village that hosted Christ's synagogue, whose name was later shortened to Nahum and then Hum, before becoming a ghost town, would eventually house an encircled pentagram and hexagram. These Jews were extremely Hellenized, which most often means alchemy, and otherwise mixed, even in Jesus' day. His disciples often had Greek and Aramaic names, and if they didn't already, he sometimes renamed them, such as renaming Simon Peter, for example. And the hexagram was used for decorative purposes only, that is, not symbolically or liturgically. Never before the third century do we find Jews using the hexagram, and even then only for decoration. It was certainly not considered to be the Star of David. So, for example, it is nowhere in Jewish temple specifications or ruins that we can find. Plus, since the Hebrew name is Magen David, Magen meaning shield, it is even fallacious to infer that any biblical passage referring to a star, and it's usually in a pagan context when it does, by the way, but even then, it's not fair to think that it necessarily means a polygram, but simply a star in the night sky, rather. Moreover, in the Hebrew scriptures, six is a numerical device that refers to original man, not to be confused with Adam, uh, original man being created on the sixth day. This should speak volumes about Zionism's secretly godless nature, but we'll see more soon. Similarly, as seen in the first slide, it is n also not uncommon to find swastikas and other Indian import in mosaic synagogue tile inlays.
and in the case of swastikas, we are talking about the Holy Land. We're not not Syria. And now we're looking at Syria here. Uh, this is in Khazaria, Inception Unknown, Part One. Damascene metallurgy, original date unknown. Hexagram with small inner circle, meaning proved, in the sense of tested. The seldom discussed yet historically crucial Khazars famously hired out their notoriously savage and unscrupulous mercenaries throughout Europe. They were almost as bad, in fact, as the later Crusaders, lol. Um, hence, since the forging, uh, the forging of swords was a prized industry throughout medieval Khazaria, and Damascus was famous for its hexagram-quality swords, so much so that still today, U.S. and U.K. military put the hexagram on swords, though these are no longer forged in that far-off birthplace of urbanization. In Khazaria, circa A.D. 650 to 1048, Part 2. Khazaria, hexagram outline with inner quadrants. The Khazars converted to some kind of, quote, Judaism, perhaps as early as 740 A.D., in a bid for political neutrality. But funny things happened along the way. The number 6 and the letter G are associated with the male member, as in the obelisk but especially the rounded Khazarian obelisk and tower pictured above. Their ancestral re uh, religion was the Turkic phallus cult. Indeed, the Turkish city of Karabiga is the only city on earth that used to be called Priapos, or Priapus in Latin, after the Greek god of male genitalia, kind of a rural version of Saturn, since both are associated with all fertility from agriculture to human reproduction. Phalli and obelisks seem to go hand in hand with base worldly magic and worldly control, such as in ancient Egypt and many important church and state centers of Western power, from the Renaissance uh, banking takeover onward. And we'll see more in the Aleister Crowley cult, very influential in rock music. Um, the pattern suggests that the Khazars have learned more from Pharaoh and from Hitler and that type of people than from their spiritual organ donors, the Israelites. In Khazaria, circa A.D. 650 to 1048, part 3. Khazar religion uh, and state hexagram with inner circle and outer circle. This seems to be some kind of seal or coin of the realm. Such engravings as this, quote, were found on circular Khazar relics and bronze mirrors from Sarkal, or White House, that's a fortress, and Khazarian grave fields in Upper Saltov. That's on the Don River, south of uh, southern Russia, and just over the border in modern Ukraine's aptly named Khazariv region, respectively. However, rather than um, having been made by Orthodox Jews, these appear to be shamanic sun disks, end quote. That's according to the Jews of Khazaria by Kevin Allen Brook. The Khazar sun symbol was the original Star of David. Fancy that. Please note that the only way to stay Jewish during these centuries was to do it the Khazar way. And so unorthodox, so unorthodox was that way of Judaism, they ended up as part of a sect known as the Karaite Jews, a sort of Bible alone theology within Judaism, that you actually don't find hardly any rabbinical Jews, much less the remaining actual Sadducees, writing to or about them. Khazar geography, 553 A.D., A.D. 651, 653, 671, 971, 914, 966. And here we have the migration patterns. You can pause this at any time, take a look.
the Khazar world. It's a noble, mercenary, cavalryman, king, and Kagan, or high priest. In Khazaria, AD 1008, Part 6. The hexagra hexagram in the Leningrad Codex, the oldest surviving copy of the Masoretic Text. A Mazora is a fetter or bond. The MT, which the Dead Sea Scrolls have shed a lot of light on, turns out to have been a restrictive, biased, and mind-controlling compilation sponsored by Khazars at the height of their clout, with the agenda of consolidating the rabbi's power by dispelling the claims to legitimacy laid by Christian and perhaps Muslim clerics, by delegitimizing, in the eyes of the common Jew, Jesus's, and perhaps Muhammad's otherwise plausible fulfillment of certain prophecies. Though arguably the Christian case and probably the Muslim ta case was never quite airtight in a linear or literal sense, but it has proved uh, nonetheless appealing to many in a mystical or spiritual sense. As a side note, uh, the Hungarian Ashkenazi in particular are unabashedly Khazar, and it is another seldom mentioned fact that among Hungarian villagers, uh, and not Transylvanian nobles, that serious accounts and professional attestation of vampirism did occur in the 19th century, with all the stereotypical bells and whistles, obviously beyond mainstream science, but I wouldn't rule out military intel. And this is, uh, see the writings of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Obvious plus genetically proven. According to an Oxford journal, the best DNA data presently available points unmistakably to what savvy, savvy historians have always known, that Ashkenazi Jews descend from the Khazars. The study concludes, quote, Our findings support the, uh, the Khazarian hypothesis, end quote, of Ashkenazi ancestry, which in turn agrees, quote, with recent studies and oral and written traditions, end quote. So, controversial or not, this is rock-solid fact, and there is no longer room, frankly, to reckon a person who denies it as stable or trustworthy. And here we have the, perhaps, hypothetical Merlin's Circle. Here we have the very historical Karamid dynasty flag, seldom discussed. This was in modern-day Turkey. And here we have some Christian uses in Eastern Europe in medievality. Macedonian Orthodox Christianity, hexagram outline with Christ triumphant, Eastern Orthodox icon containing Christ returning as all judge or Pantocrator. Detail of an icon at St. Nicola Church in Crucevo, Macedonia. Note the masculine and feminine hands holding the hexagramic icon, Balanc balancing masculine and feminine which the hexagram does, is a clear theme of Christ in Christian temples, that's churches, um, often in the form of Jesus and Mary, who are often depicted with squared and round shapes respectively, whom, interestingly enough, the Quran claims are the only two human persons untouched by evil. In fact, the 19th century Roman Catholic dogma of Mary's Immaculate Conception that's around the same time as they came up with papal infallibility, actually, is a very Muslim one. And as we'll see, the Judeo-Islamic mystical sensibilities exert great influence on post-Reformation Roman Catholic Christianity via the Jesuits and also the barefoot Carmelites. Interestingly enough, the Antiochians or Melkites are the most Jewish, uh, or in the sense of Sephardic Christians, and Russians 
would be the most Khazarian or Ashkenazic Christians. Fun facts. In Western Europe, High Medievality, Part 1. Occultism, interlacing hexagram with outer circle. Again, your standard Saturnian talisman with similar pentagram. Uh, that's pentacle. The hexagram was and is used by necromancers, Kabbalah Jews, esoteric Muslims, and Western practitioners to summon and enlist watchers, which is referred to as jinn in Islam, that refers to these beings who are neither angels nor men, but rather quasi-physical, interdimensional shapeshifters, uh, enlisted for various tasks. The shapes they bear are often called magic circles and are drawn on the ground or floor with Hebrew or other arcane letters for the purpose for the purposes of Abramelian or Key of Solomon type labors. Alistair Crowley, black magician, liturgist, and founder of the OTO and Thelema, who we'll see later on, is a prime modern example who was hugely influential on many of the commercial ages rock musicians. The emphasis on will and phallus is key here. See philosophers Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, not to mention Freud. Um, whence Islam's soaring minarets and its stress on Allah's will, to the exclusion of free will and even good will. Wherever will, whether it be human or divine, is seen as supreme, using and abusing people comes naturally. Modern neo-Jesuitical cults such as the Legion of Christ which have lately swarmed the Vatican, um, and in which my own, in my own search I spent my late teens and early adulthood, are prime examples. If you sincerely seek a true religious p path of peace, please consider Jainism over these faiths that are in such deep denial as to call themselves religions of peace, while allowing and even encouraging bloodbaths. And by everybody count, the bloodiest religion would be communism. In Western Europe, High Medievality, Part 2. Alchemy, that is, ancient chemistry. Double hexagram, not necessarily interlacing. Is made by combining all the material elements. In Rosicrucian and Hermetic Magic, this is a quote, the seven traditional planets correspond with the angles and the, cent at the, s and the center of the hexagram in the same patterns as they appear on the Sephirot and on the Tree of Life. Saturn, although formally attributed to the Sephira of Bina, within this framework nonetheless occupies the position of Dot. That's according to the Ritual Magic Manual by David Griffin. In review, the best sources tell us that the hexagram represents not the Jewish menorah or the Birkat Konanim, just some of the lies I'm aware of being I'm aware of being used to keep true Jews in a uh, quiet in the Anglophonic world. Rather, it is always understood in the West as being radically esoteric and against religious observance, representing the Kabbalistic tree fruits, the planets, especially Saturn, Khazar syncretism, in other words, religious mixing and abominations, and as we see above, quote, in alchemy, the two triangles represent the reconciliation of the opposites of fire and water. Quote from Wikipedia. Perhaps the hexagram also symbolizes the fifth element, that's quintessence, meaning the fifth substance, also called spirit or ether. Incidentally, alchemy associates Saturn with lead, their occupation of, of the alchemists uh, being that of mentally transmuting uh, lead into gold. Gold being associated with the sun. Um, this could be the real reason some of your less orthodox historical theorists today uh, like to suggest that Saturn used to be our sun. In Western Europe, late medievality part one. 
Alchemy that is again ancient chemistry. Uh, hexagram taken to mean the seal or signet ring of Solomon. Uh, there's your Arabic. Um, let me get, take a crack at that. Uh, Katim Sulaimani. Close enough, right? <laughs> also Vishnu or preserver or savior, literally penetrator. Uh, to our right hand side, again showing the Indian origin. Um, even if the hexagram had signified David, um, there have been no disinformation attempts, to my knowledge, to associate it with Moses or any Messiah figure. Um, Solomon being the temple builder. Um, but the Moses or Messiah figure is what Herzl and Zionism style their sort of mytho mythos after. Um, but for the, uh, you know, for anything like that, we're forced to look eastward to India. So again, even the recasting of the Star of David is still of an ancient Indian mindset, fascinatingly. In Bavaria, Late Medievality, Part 2. Bavaria, interlacing hexagram with Bierstein. Seldom mentioned yet ubiquitous tavern anchor in southern Germany, that's also known as Catholic Germany. Quote, it is a symbol for the tapping of beer and sign of the Brewers Guild. In German, this is called Bierstein, or Beer Star, or Brauerstein, a Brewers Star, according to Wikipedia. In Germany, Late Medievality, Part 3. German a Cathedral Architecture. Hexagram with Outer Circle. See also Saturnian Talisman from earlier. This is the steeple of the Marktkirch in Hanover, Germany, or Market Church. On European coats of arms, badges, and flags, i.e. heraldry, and later on, Later, on the first pages of books, which of course Germans were the first in publishing unless we count the Chinese, a hexagram is a fairly common charge employed, though it is rarely called by this name. In Germanic re regions, it is known simply as a star. In English and French heraldry, however, the hexagram is known as, the, as a moulet of six points, moulet being French for a spur rowel. That's the pointy part of a spur worn by knights and later cow herders, which is shown with five points, uh, five pointed arms by default, unless otherwise specified. So in Central Europe, in other words, when they ha think of a star, it has six points, while for most English speakers, we tend to doodle stars with five points, generally by default again not without exception. Okay. Please note uh, the Luther Rosy Cross seal on the flag. This is known as Luther's Cross. There is much more occultism in Protestantism than we often give it credit for. And this may help us comprehend why their persecution of witches proved to be the most enthusiastic of anyone's. Unenlightened magicians simply cannot abide competition, see the Rockefellers, and Protestantism has always been a kissing cousin of Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. Martin Luther, ever the medievalist and narcissist, wrote in his book The Jews and Their Lies out of frustration that he did not see any indicators that the Jews were ever going to convert even to his pristine version of Christianity. LOL hilarious character. Oh, so many issues. Who decides what's enlightened? Well, speaking of Bavaria, the infamous 1776 Bavarian Illuminati, or self-proclaimed enlightened ones, and the French Enlightenment movement, the Catholic Encyclopedia points out that, quote, the spirit of the Illuminati, end quote, 
was actually spread abroad faster. I'm just paraphrasing them because they're so wordy. Um, thanks to persecution by the Pope and the Elector of Bavaria. This was three years after the Jesuits were suppressed, quote-unquote, forever, in all Catholic countries, and only Prussian Protestant and Russian Orthodox Christians kept them around at this point. Um, the Russian state banished them in 1820 under Orthodox clerical pressure. And in this vacuum, the Illuminati spread so fast for back then that in a 19, uh, 1798 private letter now kept at the Library of Congress, George Washington, an avowed Freemason, and who had other issues you can read all about, um, having just stepped down from eight years as president of the newly formed United States of America, expressed to a concerned clerical associate of his that he fully shared the preacher's unsettling awareness, quote, that the doctrines of the Illuminati and the principles of Jacobinism, end quote, now, both these groups were instrumental to the French Enlightenment, the French Revolution, and the seldom discussed goddess of reason cult, uh, were winning over to their radical secularism the Masonic, Lodge, the Masonic Lodges of the newly formed United States. Uh, according to Washington's letter. Such a phenomenon among the pillars of our communities in the United States certainly goes to explain the more glaring discrepancies between what the Founding Fathers actually set forth in writing and what this country has become, namely an ACLU dictatorship and an APAC vassal state. About Illuminati founder J. Adam Weishaupt, his disgruntled partner Philo said that Weishaupt's pet design was, quote, to utilize for good purposes the very means which the Jesuits employed for evil ends, end quote. This is Philo here, actually. Philo bluntly states that Weishaupt felt the need to insist on, quote, despotism of superiors and the, quote, blind, unconditional obedience of subordinates, end quote. And it even occurred to Philo that Weishaupt was, quote, a Jesuit in disguise. We can't help agreeing that anyone whose idea of good leaves no room for freedom is a pathological elitist who regards you and me as livestock and deserves to be shunned early and often. Just a close-up of the Goddess of Reason cult in France. Note how the windows, I don't know if you can see it with this quality of image, but the windows are actually um, filled in with masonry bricks. It's a church that they've converted, obviously. Okay. Next, please. But the ties that bind the Jesuits, the Illuminati, and the so-called Enlightenment movement, however, run much deeper. Because 250 years earlier in Spain, Ignatius of Loyola and his six companions founded the Society of Jesus, or in Spanish, La Compañía, that was in 1534. And six years before that, uh, Ignatius had been charged by the newly formed Spanish Inquisition for fraternizing with Los Alumbrados, which is Spanish, where Illuminati is Latin, both just meaning the enlightened ones. Authorities have always considered that the overwhelmingly Iberian spiritual impetus behind the Catholic Counter-Reformation, Ignatius of Loyola, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, had an overpoweringly, that's the key word, Judaist, Islamist taste to it. But whatever filled the bill to give the papal institution the credibility transfusion it so desperately wanted, was ultimately given the green light. Certainly just as the masculine, uh, certainly just as the mainline Judaism we see today is not at all what it was in AD 70, as many a Jewish encyclopedia attests, likewise the Roman papacy sort of died, and when it was reborn it found itself saddled with an enlightened Catholic Jesuit superior general uh, eventually spiritually directing His Holiness the Pope. 
and getting back to 1776, the Jesuits were not to stay suppressed forever, obviously, but were, they were reinstituted 80 years later. The counter-reformed church featured a thinking clergy for a thinking population, just as the Zionists would later follow suit, styling themselves as nationalist rabbis for modern, secular, in other words, Marxist Jews. But the elite do appear to have evolved, do not appear, sorry, rather, to have evolved inwardly, but rather much to the contrary. So they speak the jive, but they're, they're just the same cats. It's meet the new boss, same as the old boss. The dogma of scientism and the tyranny of so-called consensus we hear so much about today has simply replaced what earlier had been the religious councils and popes, just as you can visibly see bank towers overshadow our cities in place where the modern where the church steeples had been. Um, but they still look down on us, so it's the same dynamic ultimately in that regard. Uh, going back even further, Illuminationism, by the way, started off as a 12th century Persian, that's Iranian, esoteric school within Islam. Far from being something sterile or rational, it is a philosophy of total reliance on divine grace for all our thought processes. Interesting. Uh, whether or not any of today's institutions claim direct lineage to the Illuminati is on many levels, in my book, irrelevant, given the tendency we have seen of institutions to adapt and self-reinvent. So they wouldn't be the same thing anyway. Um, but there are groups and levels, degrees within esoteria calling themselves Illuminati. Um, so draw your own conclusions on that. But what to me is both crucial and crystal clear is that the elitists who hijack the powerful idea of enlightenment are secretly occultists. You, you don't... elitists are occultists. You, it's inevitable, invariably. Find me one that's not. I challenge you. Um, and these people have zero faith in humanity, or they wouldn't be elitists. Uh, hence their oratory is carefully worded doublespeak akin to what lawyers, salesmen, and damn near every professional today uh, sort of feeds their prey or clients to simultaneously puff them up and file down their rights and dignity. So ebbing away or gradually, that's what rhetoric and salesmanship uh, and legalese are designed to do. That's why we're not taught law anymore in school. Uh, or even history, for that matter, goodness. Um, this quite unenlightened illuminationism comes from Islam, is seen in all the best-remembered schools of the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, and later in the state-worshipping religion of communism, which has murdered countless millions in the last century, vastly more than any other ideology on earth ever. Um, both groups' High Holy Day is actually May 1st. So you've probably figured out by now that the Illuminists were never against authoritarianism. For the not-so-secret reason they call themselves the Illuminati is because they think, irrationally, let's all agree, that they alone can claim the appellation enlightened. We'll see this attitude among the Ashkenazi admirers, uh, the secularist Zionists, and in particular the Parashim Society, later. The term Enlightenment stopped having anything to do with reason on the day when the control freak Illuminati got hold of it, that is, 1776. You want to wonder why would a so-called order of light need to work under cover of darkness? Answer: They are the self-chosen people. Therefore, they would regard you and me as cattle. With this understanding, everything we see in our world today can be richly illuminated indeed. In America, date disputed, part one. The reason the date is disputed, I think, is because nobody talks about this pre Washington president that we had. 
United States of America, implied hexagrams with large outer circles, the great seal and reverse of the U.S. one dollar bill, which as of 1913 actually is not printed under U.S. auspices, but by the so-called Federal Reserve, a private for-profit corporation that has shown prodigious skill in wiggling out of congressional auditing any authority or true oversight. As you can see on the center s circle above, uh, it spells Mason, M-A-S-O-N, if you connect the dots of the that are connected by the red lines that were superimposed, um, which is not actually part of the seal, um, using the first and last letter of each line with the central letter of the bottom line. Overruling, uh, I'm sorry, the original designer was actually President John Hansen, George Washington's seldom discussed predecessor. FDR overruling the design by his VP, then Ag Secretary, Henry Wallace, arch new dealer known to dabble in very odd things himself, uh, FDR made the ex executive decision that the pyramid should take precedence over the eagle on the dollar bill. And for that, you need only read Occult America by Mitch Horowitz. In America, A.D. 19th century, Part 2. Hexagram or pentagram, with inner circle or without, worn by U.S. sheriffs and marshals. The Corsican French arch revolutionary Napoleon Bonaparte had a lot. Pardon me. Had a lot to do with introducing stellated geometry to the modern official insignia for so-called ministries as he termed them, borrowing church jargon. In Ashkenazi lands, A.D. 19th century, Pale of Settlement, the hexagram became a huge fad throughout Ashkenazi lands from Prague eastward, and were used to mark off the large ghettos of Russia, in the regions bordering Prussia, now Germany, and Austria-Hungary, as on this map. It is here that this Khazar Karamanid emblem becomes a sociological sign that means racist apartheid, segregation, and nationalism, which is key to understanding the Nazi and Ashkenazi Zionist Israel elite of today. In Northern Africa, A.D. 1873 and 4, Hexagram with outer circle on the obverse of Moroccan four follows coin. The green pentagram on Morocco's current flag as of A.D. 1915 refers to Solomon. The significance here uh, is that the Sephardic Jews' Muslim neighbors in Spain and northern Africa, whom they tended to get along with uh, in business, medicine, and many other areas of life, used the hexagram while the Sephardim themselves, the real Jews, did not, since indeed it has no real historic Jewish significance. It is clear that the Muslim states of Africa valued their Indian stuff. That's, they were proud of having, you know, taken over what today is Pakistan, I guess. Um, it was actually through them, and thanks to Fibonacci's genius, that we got the Indic numerals we use today. Late Modernity. Masonry, theos the Theosophy, and Rael. Composite interlocking hexagramic symbols. Masons almost always defer to Muslims, and this is no exception. They are the only two groups, in fact, that's Mohammedans and Masons, who insist that hexagram is the Star of David. Contrary to the historical record, and the traditions of observant Jews and scholarly Jews. 
Many Raelians are vying to rehabilitate the swastika. The symbol uh, initially used by the Raelian movement, since it resembled the hexagram with the image of a swastika embedded in its center, caused quite a stir when the group proposed, proposed to build the Raelian embassy in Israel. Rael's Elohim voices then told him to propose building the embassy instead in Lebanon. Note, uh, the increasingly known Ordo Templi Orientis have Illuminati as a level of initiation within their hierarchy. They're just one example. It's a side note. Why, oh why, is the graduation cap called a mortarboard? Mortar, referring to bricks, referring to masons. Um, also, the tassel goes back to the Algerian fez, or Moroccan. So, draw your own conclusions on that one. I got nothing. All right. In Germany, 1891 A.D., the Star of David was never, and this is a quote from the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs website, the Star of David was never a uniquely Jewish symbol, end quote. And here's a quote from Dr. Henry Abr Abramson, who will soon be the dean of the Lander College of Arts and Sciences. He says, quote, the Star of David was not a traditional Jewish symbol for about another 800 years after the Khazarian Empire. It is quite likely simply a pagan symbol of that time. Theodore Herzl, the undisputed yet seldom mentioned founder of Zionism, first sketched this Zionist flag in his diary. The design was proposed in 1891. Noteworthily, he does not refer to the hexagram as the Star of David. It's hard to know from this if he is being self-hating or historically accurate. But judging by the rest of his diary, which is to say the least controversial and to be really blunt about it, is anti-Semitic to a Nazi degree, my money's on the former. Um, note, Herzl called it not Israel, but the Jewish state, since he had no religious motives, and if he had his druthers, would have established it in the much more germane colony of Argentina. Uh, germane is a pun, by the way. Who decides who's Jewish? Suppose we gave scholarship a chance. Well, if we do that, then we see the Konan Gadol, which is the high priest of Temple Judaism. This would be the most Jewish thing you could see, because we have the incense, the Ark of the Covenant, all the works. And here are two modern Jewish leaders. Uh, one of them is Sephardic, the other is Ashkenazi. I guess it sort of explains itself. Um, and even if it didn't, again, we have uh, a preponderance of genetic information, so much so that, shockingly, even yes people are confessing that the 25% twenty of the world's ethnic Ashkenazi males and 63% of females, in other words, that's your traditionally lineage-bearing quote-unquote Jewish mothers, have no Middle Eastern blood in them at all. In fact, you are hard-pressed to find a single Ashkenazi with so much as a quarter Middle Eastern ancestry. Thus, their claims to, on Palestine are fraud at its finest. Here again, the migration patterns for your reference. In Palestine, A.D. 1927, Part 1. Original flag of the British Mandate of Palestine, or Mandatory Palestine. As you can see, I have to point this out, the sloppiness of the design and also of the borders. Uh, 
very, very much indicative of a declining empire's sensibilities, or lack thereof. In Palestine, A.D. 1933, Part 2. Hexagram with large outer circle. This is the coin the Nazis struck after their trek to northern Palestine and their six-month stay in 1933 with Baron von Mildenstein, who would himself in 1935 become the head of the Jewish desk of the SS Security Service. Himself a guest of the Kibbutzim, Zionist communes, and the Histradrut, Zionist Union. The seldom mentioned Havra Agreement, or transfer agreements, that's, there were two of them in fact, which quite clearly constitute a Zionist Nazi conspiracy, about which juicy and gory also details abound, was Hitler's final solution to Europe's Jewish problem as the Nazis and later uh, the Zionists and later the Nazis following suit termed it, as well as to some of the Nazi party's rather serious strategic problems of that time early on. Um, the Nazis and the Zionists, in other words, uh, are a match made in hell, pretty much. This transfer would later be artfully misremembered with the help of the top Stalinists, all of them Ashkenazi, compared with whom Hitler was an amateur, as an eradication plan. This preposterous allegation of genocide, which is actually a projection on the part of Stalinists, since contrary to all popular myth, the Stalinists not only killed many more than the Nazis ever did, even by the Stalinists' own numbers, but like Hitler, um, like Hitler did for certain um, racially as well as politically uh, profile in the process. Now, let me say that again. Like Hitler, the Stalinists uh, for certain uh, racially as well as politically profiled groups that they exterminated, or certainly that the Stalinists exterminated. Hitler mostly transferred. Um, and then of course genocide was later up to Holocaust, and ever since the 80s you can even spell it with a capital H, it just magically keeps upping the ante, uh, while the death tolls magically grew and grew over the decades. Uh, this all was part of part and parcel of the new Jew mythology that casts Hitler, um, who actually seems to have deviated at some point from the Zionist plan, we'll see that later, uh, casts him in the role of the Pharaoh of Exodus and Herzl and Zionism as the new Moses or Messiah. This has proved instrumental in enlisting religious Jews whom they secretly despise, and were already planning to marginalize and disenfranchise, along with middle, the Middle Eastern and other Sephardic Jews, whose only crime, it seems, was being too lenient, uh, too Jewish, too peace-loving, too God-fearing, too moderate, moderate, and perhaps not. I've heard that I've heard quotes basically saying not manly enough. You know, be a, be a man, don't be a Jew. Basically, is the message of Zionism. Uh, not manly enough to deserve Herzl's legacy of Zionist workers' paradise. Uh, the thing about a workers' utopia, it's quite a dystopia for those who tune in or coalesce spiritually uh, with something other than the state, such as the Jewish religion, for example. And Zionism, the state of Israel, is an excellent example, so-called Jewish state they only mean that racially uh, and not even that as we've seen. And above and below the coins here in the picture I've added some more excellent examples of contemporary Ashkenazi branding by uh, on the left uh, Stalinists and in the center Zionists and to the right Randians. In other words, uh, believers in Gene Simmons' own words in the unitive power of selfishness. That's a reference to Ayn Rand's book, The Virtue of Selfishness. Um, these are all, Ash all Ashkenazi folks as well. In 
in Central Europe from A.D. 1933. Having instituted concentration camps and signed the Havra Transfer Agreements, 1933, to Shanghai Jews to the sands of Palestine, and having stripped all Jews of their citizenship, 1939, Adolf Hitler's administration obliged Jews to brand themselves with yellow-filled hexagramic badges, with faux Hebrew letters that spelled Jew in German and other languages, 1939, in keeping with a medieval Catholic custom for the, quote, protection of Jews and also Muslims, they would do this too, uh, or for, I guess, as they saw it, or said they saw it. Um, they also had them register slash surrender their weapons, 1938, and go to the ghettos in 1939, and then on to the concentration camps. Um, uh, by the way, Auschwitz began, I think, in 1941, 41, sorry. This is key. Um, throughout modernity, the hexagram represents Jewish zoning and ghettoization, beginning with the Pale of Settlement of the Ashkenazi of Eastern Europe, continuing under Hitler, and presently under the Zionists, who try to oblige all Jews to abandon their nations of residence and their religion to live in the socialist, Khazar-run terrorist, um, if you don't believe they're terrorists, just go ahead and search the Levant Affair and the USS Liberty. State of Israel. Uh, the Nazis' soulmates is pretty much what they were and are. In Poland from A.D. 1933, Part 1. In fact, as an alternative to the yellow stellated badge, in 23 November, Hans Frank, who was Hitler's half-Jewish lawyer slash general governor, who admitted in a dying note that Hitler had been a quarter Jewish, ordered all Jews, all Jewish Poles, above the age of 11 in German-occupied Poland, because remember the Stalinists occupied the other half and invaded it at the same time, keep forgetting. Um, anyways, uh, so Hans Frank obliged the Jews under his command uh, to wear a seldom mentioned, these seldom mentioned white armbands, you can see this young man handing them out uh, with a blue Magen David on them. That's the shield of David. Um, this flies in the face of all official narrative, and it, yet it offers another glimpse into how closely the Zionists and the Jewish Nazis were collaborating at this time. Not to mention, of course, the, the, um, the Marxists, the Stalinists, the Reds, um, which will will give us a context for understanding the Havre agreements and a myriad of other examples of close Zionist-Nazi cooperation, especially between 1933 and 1941, because after that Hitler, who fell terminally ill, kind of went rogue, uh, started by printing a national uh, instead of private currency, which was not okay with the bankers who were funding him. Uh, and was the one event that changed between he was he had been a media darling in the whole Western world, especially the United States, FDR, Disney, they were all fans of his. Um, we just wonder why. Well, there's lots of reasons why. I mean, just wake up. Um, sorry. And that's the only thing he did different was print his own currency, uh, and then suddenly he was becoming being denounced as this arch anti juriist and I say Jew, anti-Jewry and not anti-Semite, um, which many Stalinists, apparently, I think, that's what they think they're saying when they use the term anti-Semite in some special way that only applies to the Ashkenazi and not even Middle Easterners. So if you can understand this sort of communist new language, maybe you can explain it to me. All right. In Poland, A.D. 1933, Part 2. The clearest example of the Zionist mindset, this is a quote from Rabbi Raphael, Raphaelov, scholar of Zionist literature, the clearest example of the Zionist mindset is the flag of the state. Anyone who looks at the flag can discern, if you take out the star for a moment, a talit, a traditional man's prayer shawl, white fabric with two stripes of techlet, Teklet being an ancient blue dye that was lost to be refound only in the end of days. 
um, a talit, a talitot, all talitot, there we go, have stripes except for Sephardic Jews, that is, all Middle Eastern Jews, for example. So in every respect, the flag sends an anti-Jewry, Ashkenazi-only message. Um, and these stripes can be either blue or black. To them, them being the Ashkenazi, the Tachlet symbolized redemption of the people of Israel. That was what they wanted. Here we've come, to the land. Exile is over. We've come. We've come back to our roots. We're reunited. We're here. That was the Tachlet. And I just insert here, I trust the supreme irony of the notion of ethnic Ashkenazi quote-unquote returning to Palestine is lost on no one. Another point that is also very important, Rabbi continues, it tells a message it sends a it tells a message to the Jew. And that message is, if until now you were required to wear a talit on you, it is no longer necessary. You can just put it on the flag and feel good as a Jew. Your talit on the flag. Everyone sees it. That's sufficient. No need to fulfill the commandments in practice. Just connect with their spiritual national spiritual content and that's sufficient. So again, it's just clearly this um, fascist mindset that the state is God. Um, they may as well have just come out and said it. Okay. In Israel, A.D. 1948. Flag of the Israeli Defense Forces. And as a side note, I just have to ask, why does the USA automatically label all deceased Jews as Zionists. I, I know plenty of Jews who aren't terrorists. It's just absurd. It's like they want us to be anti-Jew or something. Um, bunching them all together like that. And this is uh, Theodor Herzl's tomb in Vienna. Uh, now, other secret societies try it out. Now, firstly, again, it helps to point out that Masons are best understood as an arch coven of male witches, and in the Western world, witchcraft is by and large code for Kabbalah. The craft, as members call it, mimics witchcraft in many telling respects, and by mid-century it's caught on that using hexagrams to con and conquer is trendy among the elite. With the crypto caganate of Israel established, its economic feeding tube hooked up to the new global empire of the USA, itself only just a front for the banking empire, the real empire, uh, and the USA leaders just really sock puppets is what they are, uh, the occult societies who value power, not truth, and who have long admired and emulated those who falsify ancestry and history for tawdry gain, we're talking about the Muslims, um, are impressed, in fact enamored, and they want to get in on the materialistic spiritual decay action of the Zionists. And so it is now, in this age of political pseudo-Israel, that you start to see the hexagram on Masonic paraphernalia, as for example, in England, AD 1950, Talk about your Stockholm Syndrome. Masonry. Royal Arch Freemasons Medallion. Quoting Albert G. Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, quote, The interlacing triangles, or deltas, symbolize the union of the two principles or forces, the active and passive, male and female, pervading the universe. The two triangles, one white and the other black, typify the mingling of apparent opposites in nature, darkness and light, error and truth, ignorance and wisdom, evil and good, throughout human life." End quote. Please note that the Masons, and this quote is a great example of that, number one, hate intuition and rhyme, and love equating femininity with evil ignorance and irrationality, as we saw. Um, their jealous goddess of reason apparently is a hard taskmis taskmistress and much like Mrs. Muhammad, uh, wants all women either ashamed or degraded. Um, and 
secondly, Masons are, apart from Muslims, the... Huh. I don't know what I wrote there. <laughs> apart from Muslims, Masons are the just the worst historians you're likely to meet. And uh, there's nothing to indicate that the hexagram was found within the structures of the of King Solomon's temple, but rather quite the contrary. Again, uh, nor is it mentioned in the Bible's exhaustive temple specifications. See Leviticus. Um, in fact, Masons and only Masons uh, would think of dating the hexagram in the Semitic, that is, Judeo-Arabic world, to before the third century. In Ireland, A.D. 2008, we got the Walmart thing, because that was also 2008, but obviously not in Ireland, that was in Ohio, um, or wherever they're headquartered now. Um, masonry, interlacing double hexagram with large outer circle. The Baden-Powell Royal Arch Chapter Insignia of Irish Craft Masonry, which has been trendy as the Irish have drifted from Roman Catholicism, due apparently to exhaustive abuse, whose effects are then compounded by poorly veiled media enthusiasm, reporting caustic gossip prematurely, etc. Uh, the presence of the hexagram in recent Masonic albums, emblems, is highly suggestive of infiltration by the Parashim Society in the occult power players of the British Isles that has intensified since the establishment of the Ashkenaz Zionist State of Israel word is trademarked, by the way. I'm just kidding. Uh, in Digitalia, AD 2010. Facebook. Covert tilted hexagram with large outer circle. Facebook's once secret encyclopedia that appears to be inscribed with blue li on the blue lining inside the inner circle's hoodies. This was revealed to the world as seldom mentioned Wall Street Journal uh, WSJD Live conference, in which a visibly surprised and unguarded Mark Zuckerberg had become extremely uncomfortable with the questions being posed to him and reluctantly removed his hooded sweatshirt, revealing the above insignia. Uh, by the way, he removed it because he was sweating, not because he was going to fight them. Uh, it says, making the world open and connected. And my thought on this is, wouldn't it be great if the deep state got a Facebook account and posted all of their nude pics of their operations and plans on it? That would be, right, open and connected. The way I think. Well, all I can say is, thank God that for every Mark Zuckerberg, there's an Edward Snowden. My summary. The overwhelming evidence says that the hexagram, contrary to its common English language nickname, originates only in India and never stood for any ancient king of Israel. Everywhere western, west of India, it has been a brand for an unstable fringe. Most recently, an extremist, warmongering ideology spawned from Czech and German quarters that mutates Judaism and manipulates the whole developed world. The hexagram is a beautiful and meaningful shape, let's not forget. The problem that needs exposing and denouncing is precisely the way in which it was stolen and desecrated by the same crazies who stole and desecrated the name Jew. True enlightenment is diametrically opposed to force. Terms like enlightenment and symbols like the hexagram need to be redeemed and rehabilitated to their truly human and, I dare say, divine purpose. About race and ethnicity. Just a few notes for your consideration. According to the Bible, all humans must be Semitic, that is, descended from Shem, who lived in 2568 BC. Not all ethnic Jews, or Jewry, are religious Jews, that's Judaism, nor vice versa. Conversions and intermarriages are a constant historical fact. Statistically speaking, most humans are children of Abraham, who lived in 2000 BC, more or less, uh, with the possible exception of some isolated tribes. 
There is nothing enlightened and everything animalistic in the overt sexism and racism that a good old boys club or a chosen people's state blatantly implies. Enough with the fascism and enough with these powerful secret societies running our lives. Let universal freedom and brotherhood and sisterhood ring. Aum and Amen. Peace, Shalom, Namaste, Jain Jindedra.